my name is Nathan Rivers. Today's date is Friday, March 29th. Uh, I am here on the Ball State University campus in the Burkhart Building interviews, interviewing Mary Posner as part of the Ball State University Honors College Oral History Project being done in conjunction with the 60th anniversary of the Ball State Honors College. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to come up and be a part of this project. So I guess to start I'd like to ask where and when you were born. Um, <clears throat> I was born on December 7th, 1949 in Indianapolis, Indiana. All right. And could you tell me a little bit about your experiences growing up there? Well, I was one of nine children. I was number three, and I went to a Catholic grade school and a Catholic high school in Indianapolis. Um, we grew up from what later became a shopping center. We grew up uh, across from a big field and we always had a huge garden, probably an acre. My mom canned and we were always busy doing things in the garden. And my fa they started building a shopping center and my father used to hang out over there to <laughs> see what they were up to and he eventually got hired to be in charge of all the heating and air conditioning for Eastgate Shopping Center, so that was a big deal. Um, so, I, I, would you like me to go on about my life as a child for a while? Or? Oh, that's fine. Uh, could I ask, what were your uh, parents' names? John, <clears throat> John and Mildred. Okay. Munchell. Alrighty. And then, you said you had, you were part of nine children. Uh, mm -hmm. What was that like being in a family that large? It was crowded. <laughs> uh, if we got a dozen donuts. You had better be fast if you wanted to. <laughs> and, uh, and, we, and I still can't figure out where we all slept. It oh, wasn't that God. big of a house. And in fact, I, uh, one of my sisters was on a local TV show called Kindergarten College. And they interviewed her during this program. And she told them that she slept on the couch, which she did. But my mother <laughs> really didn't want everybody to know. <laughs> oh, so, uh, and my mother, she uh, had this crazy idea we ought to go to church every day during the summer. So, I mean, that's just no way for a kid to have to spend their summer. Oh, no. So, a very Catholic family, and uh, in fact, my oldest sister was a nun. Oh. Yeah. And, and all nine of us never lived together because my older sister left before my baby sister was born. Okay. And so, you brought up a, a lot already the, uh, <laughs> that you were part of a Catholic family. So mm -hmm. what was that like being, growing up in such a religious family like that? Well, I, we went to a lot of church and I went to Catholic schools. So I think that probably affected me when I came to college because I was used to pretty much spending my time with Catholics. So it was really eye-opening to come to Ball State. Um, yeah, I was in the choir. I was uh, very active in certain Catholic organizations. In fact, I was the president of the Young Christian Students, which was a Catholic organization. And they had to change the Constitution so that I could be the president of the Federation of the Indianapolis because only a boy could do it back then. Oh. <laughs> All right. So. I think you also mentioned that you were in Catholic education the entire way up. So mm -hmm. what was that like, just being surrounded by religion through all your education as well? Well, I, I think I got a really good education. Um, you know what? So, I mean, it would be hard to say. I wouldn't know what it would be like to go to a public school. Okay. Um, but I dated a lot of boys from public school, so I had some contact. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, so I guess moving forward just a little bit, uh, you went to Cessna Memorial High School. Okay, so it's pronounced Cessina. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I was having trouble trying to yeah. figure out the pronunciation. Yeah. So uh, what were your experiences there? Do you have any sort of memories that from your time there that stand out to you? or? Mm -hmm. Well, I... Um, I think a vivid memory is my English teacher who I think 
taught us to write at a college level, and I think that really maybe has something to do with me getting in the Honors College. And my first term paper was uh, pretty ambitious. It was on the immortality of the soul. So that was, that was pretty big. Um, I, uh, I was very act I was active in student council and different clubs. I was never athletic. Um, I had to work all as soon as I was 16. In fact, I think I lied and started working when I was 15. So I always worked after school and worked full time during the summer um, and spent a lot of time at the swimming pool in the summer. But as far as what it was like to be in a Catholic school, I, I really can't compare because that's all I knew. But I do know I got a really good education there. Alrighty. And you mentioned that, uh, sorry, you mentioned that uh, you, your English teacher really stood out to you and her mm -hmm. teaching. Did that maybe influence some of the direction that you wanted to go when you first arrived at Ball State? I know that in a previous conversation you said you came in thinking you wanted to teach English. Right. I, that, that probably had something to do with it. Not that I wanted to be like her because she was very mean. Uh, in fact, I have a habit of uh, fidgeting, which I did a lot in class. And I was doing that one day and she came barreling down the aisle and hit me with a ruler. They do do that. Oh, no. So <laughs> that's a pretty vivid memory. Okay. So I guess then uh, you graduated in 1967? Mm -hmm. Okay. So. You, oh, sorry, I guess go back first. Uh, you said that you worked once you turned 16. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what, what job did you have doing that? Um, I worked at a clothing store. I don't know if it still exists. It was called L Learner Shops. Um, in fact, I wrote a poem at that time, Learner Shops, Learner Shops, what a big hole. Why I work here, I'll never know. And it goes on. <laughs> uh, so I worked there, and that was they didn't even have a cash register. We had to write everything out by hand. <laughs> so it was different back then. And then after that, I worked at a bakery, and that, that was a pretty good job. And I remember I was in the school play, and I often had to show up for play practice in my bakery uniform and hairnet, which <laughs> didn't make me look oh, no. that hot. <laughs> and I had the first line in the school play. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Uh, so like I just said, uh, you graduated in 1967. So you came to Ball State pretty much immediately after that. So what drew you here? Well, I wish I had some answer that made me look good, but actually I had a boyfriend here. <laughs> um, yeah, when I was in high school, my boyfriend was at Ball State and I came up to visit him and I liked it here. And I also, I wanted to be a teacher and it started out as Ball State Teachers College. Oh, yeah. I don't think it had been a university that long. So I just thought it'd be the perfect place to go. And I was the first person in my family to leave town to go to college. My oldest sister was a nun, and my next sister went to a local college and lived at home, so I was the first person who left home. Okay. Were your family supportive of you leaving to go to Muncie, or were there some sort of tensions there? Or? Oh, no. They, uh, they were happy for me to be here. Okay. And so, I guess this would also may have been your first experience with the Honors College at this point. Mm -hmm admitting you at this point. Uh, do you remember any sort of like the early orientations or anything like that with the Honors College? I'm afraid I don't. I, I have a vague, I, I think we had a, a house, a white house that said Honors College on it. And I know I went there, but I don't remember much more than that. Okay. So I guess I'll ask then, uh, what were your sort of early academic experiences with Ball State in general or maybe the Honors College in your freshman year. I know that you had mentioned when we in a, some email conversations that you remembered uh, Dr. Arends in the English department. So I wonder if you might mm -hmm. be able to say some of the things that you rec remember. Well, you know, I don't even know if he was part of the Honors Program. I, I, I can't say that for certain, but, okay. but he was, um, I guess I, I must have had him on a in, for a course called Humanities, and he 
this was a big thing for me because being raised a Catholic, I, I just thought one way. And, you know, he brought up all these other religions and what other people believed. And it really started me questioning everything I'd al al always believed before. So that had a pretty significant impact on me. Okay. And did that start to, like, really affect how you looked at the Catholic faith and religion in general from that class, or? Uh, well, it, it really opened my mind, and, and I was probably unusual for a freshman in college. I, this church-going thing must have really been strong for me because I used to go over to the Newman Center. Sometimes I would go to church several times a week because Catholics Gosh. can do that. Um, <laughs> so the Newman Center was a really important part of my experience in college. Um, so, yeah, it was a big deal for me to question that at all. Okay. So I really remember, it, it, I think it was kind of disturbing at first to have all these new <laughs> ideas. Yeah. Alrighty. And I guess as well, going sort of along this, uh, did you have any interest in like philosophy at this point yet? I know you minored mm. in it, but I don't know no. if you. Okay. I, I minored in psychology. Oh, psychology. I'm sorry. Yeah. I think I wrote that wrong, down wrong, but psychology. But did you have interest in that at that point yet? or? Um, I didn't know anything about psychology. I'd never taken a course in psychology. But when I took Introduction to Psychology, I, I really liked it. And I, at some point, I talked to someone about possibly majoring in psychology, but they said it really discouraged me because I would be much more likely to get a job as an English teacher. They were wrong about that, but that's what they told me. So I stuck with being an English major. Okay, so I guess then as well, uh, were there any sorts of, I know you said the Newman Center already, but were there any sorts of other groups that you were involved with in early on mm -hmm. in your career or were you just sort of sticking to the academic side when you first started? Oh no, I, I, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> um, I lived in Baker Hall okay. and I, I became, a, I think when I was a freshman, I was elected to the Student Senate, so okay. I was very active in the Student Senate, and I was the chairman of what they called, it was a fun Office of Political Communications, which is really public relations. So, and I continued to be in the Student Senate throughout my college career. I eventually became a representative at large, which meant I had to be voted on by everybody on the campus, but I started out in Baker Hall. Also, in Baker Hall, I participated in Spring Sing. Okay. I don't know if they still have that. But I did bring a picture, I found, of me dressed up like a duck. Our, um, <laughs> in Spring Sing, most of the uh, people tried to look really fancy. And I lived, we were a dormitory instead of a sorority, so we weren't that fancy. And so we, saying talk to the animals and we all dressed up <laughs> like animals and I well darn I well I know it's in here but if you don't want me to look for it right now I won't yeah, we can look for it later if we need to okay okay it was a fun picture <laughs> so uh, so I participated in spring sing so we did talk to the animals one year and then we did um, I love you a bushel and a peck, and we all dressed up like hayseeds. So, <laughs> and, and the sororities were all dressed up in fancy dresses and being very serious, oh, and God. we were running around like animals. So that was fun. I also, uh, they had a lot of student dances. I never missed a dance. And yeah, I had a great time. All right. And so you mentioned that you were the representative for Baker Hall, mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, Office of Political Communications. Uh, what did these roles entail? Well, I had to go to student senate meetings. So I don't recall how often we met. And I do recall that one of the big issues was back in when I was in college, well, we didn't call ourselves women. We were girls. Girls had a curfew and boys didn't. And we didn't think that was fair. So in student senate, we proposed that we not have this curfew. Okay. So that was one thing that happened. And as the, um, we put out a newsletter 
about the Senate that was called Senate Sations, and I was the editor of that. Okay. So I've, um, yeah, well, this is a newspaper, the Student Senate Special, so I had a lot to do with putting this out. Okay. And yeah, special issues like that. Okay, I think I had seen a few of those before, but yeah. I didn't realize you were. It's as amazing about them. how m much. Okay, and here's my little newsletter that I put out. <laughs> that was back in the days when you had to print things with mimeograph, uh, Ditto's purple ink. There were no copy machines. Okay. So I think also another thing that I saw you were involved with with Student Senate, uh, and I think it was the following year, 1968, was looking into uh, discrimination and racism coming occurring in fraternities and sororities. Uh, do you re recall any of the issues with that? Or Well, I was a member of a group called the John Brown Society. Okay. There was the Black Student Union, and then the John Brown so Society was a group of white students who supported the Black Student Union. And I did go to a, a conference on racism I don't remember where that was. And I was just really proud of my family because I, I, Indianapolis at that time was an extremely prejudiced place, but my family was not like that. And okay. when I went to that racism conference, I stopped by to visit my mom with a guy who went with me and he was a, a young black man. And you know they just welcomed him in, that was fine with them. So I, I feel very fortunate that my family had the attitudes that they had. Okay. And then you mentioned the John Brown Society. Uh, so would you be able to explain just a little bit of what that was? There wasn't a whole lot available on it in the archives. Uh. Well, I, I feel bad that I, I don't remember more. I, yeah, I'm sorry. We just uh, we tried to support whatever the Black Student Union was doing. And um, I, I'm sure these issues with the soror sororities and fraternities were probably one of those. OK. So I guess. I don't know if you will remember some of this, but yeah. in uh, your sophomore year, you also took some uh, humanity sequence courses in the honors, and I wanted to know if you remembered some of them, like what were taught, what the professors were. Well, maybe that was the one where I had Dr. Aaron's. Okay. I, I think that, yeah, and that really did have a big effect on me. All righty. Uh, excuse me. Uh, and, and I don't know when I would have um, had him for a class if I did have... Uh, Dean, I remember Dean Lawhead, Victor Lawhead. He, oh, he yeah. must have been the dean of the, uh, was he the dean of the Honors College? Um, yes, uh, he was at that point. So. Okay. Well, he, he was really ahead of his time. Um, okay. Very supportive of female students. And I wrote a paper about um, how a lot of, girls at Ball State and across the country went to, Ball, went to college to get an MRS degree and that was the main thing they wanted. And I, I found a copy of the paper I wrote and he just wrote all over it. He was very supportive of the views that I had. Okay. And do you, I guess, remember like any interactions with him regarding the Honors College or? Well, I remember being in a colloquium with him uh, okay. where we met at the Honors College House. And uh, what we discuss now, I, I'm sorry that I don't know. Okay. So, I guess I'll, I'll ask, uh, did you have any like jobs at this point or? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, uh, a characteristic of my life is I have always worked and I, what was it called, work study. Now, I worked 10 hours, maybe it was, I can't believe I worked 10 hours a week. I don't see how I could have done that. So maybe it was 10 hours a month. But I started out in the biology department. Um, my mother thought I should have a backup plan, so she made me take a lot of secretarial courses. So I knew typing and shorthand. I was very good at that. Okay. So I worked for Dr. Welk in the biology department. And then I got a job for Dr. John Mood in the English department and I was his secretary and typed a lot of interesting manuscripts and um, yeah. 
he, um, he hosted W.H. Auden at his home, and I got to go to that get-together. That was very good. Yeah. He was a very radical professor. Um, he, we had a free university at one point where people could teach anything they wanted to, and he taught the history of rock and roll, so that was pretty nice. good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I guess also talking about your sophomore year, that was the year that, the one year that you were in a sorority, right? Right. So would you be able to talk a little bit about that experience? I know that you said in our pre-interview way back when mm -hmm. that you weren't really a sorority girl, but that you still had that one year. Right. So. <laughs> and I found another interesting, um, so I was at Delta Zeta. And all, I don't know what they do now, but we all had to carry around these little books and we had all kinds of tasks we had to do and carry these around and have people sign things. Um, so I, I really just went through Rush because my college roommate wanted to go through Rush and she was nervous about going by herself. So I went through it and then I was really surprised. I got invitations from almost every sorority. So that was kind of a shock. Um, and I liked some of the girls in Delta Zeta, so I pledged Delta Zeta. And I was the outstanding pledge of Indiana for Delta Zeta that year. Okay. Yeah. So what does the outstanding pledge entail exactly? <laughs> well, I think I had really good grades. And I, I don't know what else. I, I have no idea why they chose me. I mean, I, I still don't know why I was in the Honors College. But um, yeah, out of all the pledges in Indiana, I was chosen and I got some money and I, I went to this big to-do in Indianapolis. So uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was interesting. Um, and I kind of liked being a Delta Zeta, but as I became more aware of what was going on in the world and in the country, it seemed to me a lot of the things that the sorority did were kind of trivial, so I became less and less interested in what they were doing. Okay. And so, obviously, with them, that being less trivial and you being more interested in what was going on, this obviously you were very heavily involved with the Vietnam War moratorium, so mm -hmm. uh, I guess there was a rap magazine article that stated that you kind of first started to express interest in this when you posted a picture from the only alternative, which is Muncie's underground newspaper, on the uh, bulletin board of whatever job you were at at that point. Would you be able to kind of talk about what happened with that? Okay. And it's interesting, it, this um, process of preparing for this interview has been very interesting for me because I always had a certain idea what that story was, and I actually found a journal that I wrote at that time that said exactly what happened. Um, so I posted, I worked for an insurance company in Indianapolis as a file clerk. Okay. And, you know, people on their lunch hour and breaks pretty much talked about what, to my mind, were trivial things. So I posted this picture having to do with people getting napalmed in Vietnam and said, instead of talking about blah, 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 you ought to be thinking about this. Well, it didn't take long for me to get hauled into my supervisor's office and he was really upset with me and told me that I should be fired, I could be fired, and that I was a communist and I had to meet with all of the heads of the departments who had to reiterate that I was a communist. And it was pretty, pretty unpleasant. And they, I had always remembered that I was fired, but I wasn't fired. But it was pretty upsetting. And my dad had helped me get the job because he took care of the heating and air conditioning in a bunch of office buildings. So I told my dad what happened. And I, I don't think my dad really agreed with what I did, but he didn't like me losing my job. So he found me another job, and I quit. Later, I, I, I didn't quit immediately. What, what really put the icing on the cake is I had a chance to go to the National Student Congress in El Paso, Texas that summer. Okay. And I needed time off to go and they were mad at me for asking for time off. So that was the end of my job. Okay. And was the National Student Conference, was that related to 
the Vietnam War issues at all? Or? Well, um, okay, we're talking about 19, the summer of 1969, so we're talking about right before Woodstock. It was pretty interesting times. Yeah. There was a lot going on. Um, there was a lot going on about racism and anti-war things and the things people were interested in in the 60s. And that was where I found out about the Vietnam Moratorium Committee getting organized to start in October. Okay. And in fact, there was a, a guy there who I had been in high school with who started the Vietnam Moratorium Committee at Marion College in Indianapolis. And he encouraged me to start the committee at Ball State when I got back to Ball State. Well, I didn't know anything about organizing something like that. So my intention was to come back to Ball State and find somebody who knew what they were doing to organize this. And I, nobody wanted to do it, so that's how I ended up doing it. Okay. And did you have, like, anybody else on campus who was kind of supporting you in that effort to start it up? or? Like other students, I guess, or well, you know, it. I don't, I don't know how I advertised to have the first meeting, but I, I don't think I really had anybody, and uh, I must have just posted something, and a, a few people showed up, and then more people showed up. We were never a huge group, but it got bigger each time, and uh, we had a lot of guidance from the National Vietnam Moratorium Committee. Okay. So we knew what we were supposed to do each month. Was that like direct contact with them, or was it just kind of like newsletters sort of things? Or Well, um, this was before cell phones and oh, yeah. the internet, so it was uh, the U.S. mail. Okay. And then with the uh, getting that set up, I know that you had tried to get some support from the Student Senate in uh, preparations for it, and there was a good bit of tension there. They wouldn't actually go out to help you. So what was that like trying to actually get the student senate on your side? Well, it was a huge disappointment. Um, I mean, you, I was absolutely probably the least radical person around and um, I didn't think this was a radical idea, so it really shocked me that people wouldn't vote to do that. Um, Ball State was very conservative, apparently, and they just wouldn't, they okay. just, and we tried twice, and they wouldn't support it. And do you know what aspects that they really took issue with? Well, they thought we should support the president. Oh. Yeah, I, I don't think they were thinking very much. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, would you be able to actually uh, just kind of explain what the actual moratorium event entailed, just kind of for the record on this? Okay. Well, um, October 15th, 1969 was the first one, and we, we, started off, we started off with the march, and we um, really emphasized education. So we had a speaker from the American Friends service committee who spoke about Vietnam and we had uh, things printed up about the war and what was wrong with it and we read the names of the people who the servicemen who had been killed in Vietnam we stood in front of it was either the arts building or the administration building and read their names all day long and there were okay. quite a few names already and that was the thing that people really opposed on campus. They didn't want us reading those names. And do you remember why they had issue with that? Well, uh, their belief was that it demeaned their service to their country, that they had died as patriots and we were using them to protest the war. And I totally disagreed with that because our goal was to save lives and we were honoring the people who had already lost their lives. But that was the biggest issue during that first um, protest in October. Okay. And then, what was the turnout like for that event? Was it, would you say it was like successful or maybe not as many that you, as you'd like? Or? Well, we would have liked a lot more. I think it was maybe 300 people. Okay. Yeah. 
And I guess with doing this, did you have any sort of faculty support? I know that I've seen a few names mentioned later on, like Dr. Tony Edmonds here in the history department, mm -hmm. at least towards the later end of this, but I don't know. Well, right at the beginning, we had uh, Quentin Davis. He was a political science professor, and he was our faculty. You, if you were a official student organization, you had to have somebody on the faculty be a sponsor. So he was our sponsor. Mm -hmm. And David Kamens, who was a history professor emeritus here at Ball State, okay. he was on the committee. And there were other professors who were very supportive. Well, my boss, John Mood, he was extremely helpful. I think he probably let me type some things on his typewriter. And I, I, I think I might have mentioned this to you on the phone. One of my English professors wrote a poem to me about this whole thing. And, uh, okay. Do you yeah. remember which professor that was? Uh, William Miller. Okay. <laughs> All right, then. So I guess then you held a second moratorium a month later then. So mm -hmm. was that basically the same thing, just mm -hmm. another month removed or...? Well, the original idea, the word moratorium um, meant delay. The idea was we, sh the first month, we were going to spend one day focusing on the war and, and what was wrong with it. Then in November, it was going to be two days, and December three, and on and on and on. Okay. And so in November, it was two days, and... So it was a, a lot of similar activities that focus on education. We didn't read any names that month. Okay. All right. And I saw that uh, you did at least do a few marches, I think, that during that month. So. Yeah, I think we might have even gone into Muncie. We, we tried to get a permit to protest on the plaza, but we weren't able to get that, so we just yeah. went there and back. And talking about the uh, not being able to get the, per the permit, I know that became a very big issue, especially with dealing with some of the uh, veterans associations that were uh, also wanting to use it at that time. Would you be able to kind of talk about what that uh, sort of tension was like with them? Or? Well, they um, what they did is they went to the city government and arranged to have the plaza for themselves any time there was a moratorium so that we could never get a permit. So that's how they did that. But um, finally, we, we were able to protest in front of the plaza. So the veterans were on the plaza, we were in front of the plaza. And that month, we put the names of the war dead in a coffin. So they, that was, once again, something they didn't want us to do. So they fired guns over our heads while we were doing that. So there was definitely a lot of tension then. And I remember reading a lot about that incident. Uh, what was the general feeling like with the moratorium when you had that sort of the guns firing over your head? Uh, there was also a reference to base getting pretty close to a shouting match between each other. Mm -hmm. What was that kind of like in that situation? Well, uh, when I look back on it, I think I should have been more afraid than I was. Um, it, it was upsetting. But I don't, re I don't recall that any, I, I think some people cried, but I don't think we backed down at all. And on our part, I'm proud to say that every anti-war demonstration we ever had, there was never any violence at all. And I don't think we even shouted back at them much. So we conducted ourselves very well. Okay. And that was the December moratorium where that was really going on, right? I think so. Okay. And as you probably know, that um, during that time, NBC News, no, no. Yeah, I think it was NBC. Well, well, they did show, they weren't with us at that, they weren't interviewing us, but they went back and found footage of that. Okay. So, yeah. and then, I guess that kind of leads into something I'm interested in here. Uh, what was kind of the feeling with the general Muncie community about this? I know... The NBC report suggested that there was kind of a split, and then there was also a, uh, when going through some of the uh, Vietnam War moratorium, uh, the scrapbook in the archives, there was something where the several of the faculty came out with like this letter of support of you guys, not, not necessarily saying they support what you do, but they support the idea that you should be able to speak what you do without the threat of 
violence that some people that had taken an ad in the Muncie Star Press had kind of suggested. Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of curious what your sort of relation with Muncie as a whole was while doing this. Well, we did have some people from the Muncie community get involved. Um, there was this one woman named Mrs. Uplinger who came to every protest in spike heels. <laughs> she was this <laughs> funny, funny woman, but very active, and she brought her children to our protests. And um, for in January, we got together with a black church in Muncie and had a um, celebration about Martin Luther King that was also anti-war since Martin Luther King was against the war. Okay. So actually we probably got out in the community more than a lot of other colleges did. Okay. And I know I've read, read that you were like handing out leaflets and stuff like stop buying war toys and things right. like that. So. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we did that, I think it was in February, we, we went to Indianapolis because Nixon was speaking in Indianapolis. Okay. And uh, the theme was books, not bombs. Okay. So I guess just one more question with the community thing. Uh, were you ever sort of afraid of some of the community members? I Referencing that uh, letter of support that I had found, uh, there was a passage in there that talked about how uh, the VMC sponsor had had his car taken and burned at some point, so. Yeah, you know, to tell you the truth, I don't remember that happening, but I, I, I do know that the an original assistant director of the Vietnam Moratorium Committee, Howard Bunch, was a, he was on the swim team, and his coach took him aside and kind of let him know that wasn't a good idea for somebody on the swim team to do that. Okay. He also was interviewed by a couple of men from the FBI who wanted him to infiltrate and report on us. Um, so that was, I didn't know that at the time. Oh gosh. Yeah. And there was no doubt in my mind that the FBI was present. Uh, you could just tell who they were. Okay. And then you had mentioned the, uh, what was it, the uh, memorial for uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, mm -hmm. So what was that event like, since that would have involved a lot more of the community than just Vietnam protesters and the VMC and that thing? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we really, um, there was a, a minister named uh, Reverend Williams, and I believe he pretty much organized it. We didn't have to decide what we were going to do, and they really knew how to uh, have a great celebration. So there was a lot of singing and speeches. So I would say that for our part, uh, the Vietnam Moratorium people, we were there to join with them in what they were doing, but we didn't plan a lot ourselves. Okay. Now, in the NBC report that was done, they had mentioned that uh, event as well, and the uh, involvement of Students for Peace, the uh, high school group, and they had mentioned that you had been heavily involved with that as well. Would you be able to kind of elaborate on that? Well, this Mrs. Uplinger's kids were involved in that, and then there was a, a young black man named, uh, well, a boy named Tony Nathan, who was from Muncie Central, and he was in our group. And I, I don't, we had this crazy idea, and now when I look at it, I think, what were we thinking? We were going to carry him downtown on a cross. Now, that <laughs> that idea fell through. Thank God. <laughs> He was perfectly agreeable, um, so <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, we're hoping to find him. I want to talk to him and see what he thought. Um, so I don't. Know. This was 50 years ago, so I can't tell you too much more about how we got them involved. A lot of things that happened. You would think from the way the media reported it that I was hands-on doing all of this, but I really wasn't. There were a lot of other people very much okay. working hard. Like, I never asked for a permit to protest downtown. It was somebody else on the committee, but you'd think that I did all this myself, but I didn't. There were a lot of really good people. Okay. And do you remember any of the people that helped you out with this? Or? Well, Charles Heitkamp was the assistant director, and he... Um, he's the one who kept asking for the permits. Uh, but he really wanted to be the director of the Vietnam Moratorium Committee, so he, um, he wrote 
something about how awful we were in the underground newspaper, but I didn't know he did it. It was anonymous. Um, and they accused, they didn't like it that I was not a radical, so they painted me a certain way and called me a Girl Scout. So I happened to have a roommate who was a Girl Scout, believe it or not, and she still is. And she had a Girl Scout uniform. She was my size. So the next meeting of the Vietnam Moratorium Committee, I wore her Girl Scout <laughs> uniform. <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of just, you know, I just say, hey. And uh, they had an election and I was reelected and that just kind of settled it. <laughs> All right. So you mentioned like things being directed at you being published. Uh, and I know the Ball State Daily News would from time to time publish some of the letters coming home from soldiers yeah. and some of them didn't necessarily paint you in a great light. Uh, yeah. How did you react to those sorts of things coming back? Well, uh, it was very hurtful because I really, my view was that I was trying to help these people in Vietnam to come home and, and not get killed. Um, and I had a pen pal in Vietnam who was a medic and we wrote back and forth all the time and he, he strung beads for me and sent them to me and I unfortunately don't know whatever happened to him. And my future husband was in Vietnam while I was organizing all of this and he wrote an article, um, he didn't want to be in Vietnam and he wrote an article uh, that was anti-war and he sent it to Dr. Mood who I worked for and I typed it and it was printed in the only alternative. So uh, when he got out of Vietnam, we met and eventually got married. So my relationships with vets, I would say were pretty good, except for those people that, um, well, you read their letters. And after I was on national TV, there were, um, I got letters from people all over the country and some of them were pretty vicious, but most of them were very supportive. Okay. And then you mentioned how your uh, pen pal made necklaces. Is that like the uh, one that you're wearing there? Is that that one? Or? Uh, no, I, I, I don't have it anymore. Um, this necklace is one that I, I wore it today because I made this necklace when I was at Ball State. So this is a 50-year-old necklace, and I bought this when I was at Ball State. Okay. And did, was that, did you make that as just part of the BMC stuff or just kind of your... Oh, it was okay. just, uh, that was a thing back then. Okay. We, we, we made beads. All right. <laughs> All right. So you just mentioned the uh, NBC report. And so obviously that's on how you uh, protested Nixon when he visited Indianapolis in uh, February of 1970. So how did you decide that you were going to go protest him? Well... He was there, <laughs> and we wanted to be there. So I think um, we had a busload of people who went from Muncie to Indianapolis, and we got off the bus, and we were kind of we were kind of directed to go stand behind some other buses and a band that was playing very loudly, so that we couldn't be seen and we couldn't be heard and there were snipers on top of the buildings, Gosh. you know, aimed down at us. So, um, so we weren't seen or heard, but we were there. And then uh, someone from the student newspaper got arrested for, I think he accidentally knocked down a barricade, so. Oh gosh. Yeah, yeah. So was there any sorts of, with that going on, was there any sort of like fear that while you were there or? Were you involved enough with the protest going on that you didn't really think about it? I gotta say, through that whole, uh, one thing I sure remember, I was never afraid. I, I just thought we were doing the right thing and I really never worried about what would happen to us. And I, I'd say um, some of our biggest supporters were my Catholic friends at the Newman Center and I was very close to the chaplain and he gave me a lot of support and I, I just thought that Jesus was on my side and I was never afraid. Okay. And did any of your, uh, I guess, religious friends kind of support what you were doing there? 
Yeah, I, uh, we had a lot of support from the, in fact, the Newman Center was the only, the Catholics were the only people who really supported us. The other people were kind of waffly about it. Okay. So then with the Indianapolis protests, obviously this is where the NBC report comes from. So, mm -hmm. did, uh, and that was part of like a six part series on the city of Muncie. So mm -hmm. did you seek out or were you asked to be a part of that or did they just kind of, was it kind of asked when you got to Indianapolis? Well, actually the way it started was um, Muncie, as you probably know, was considered Middletown, USA because oh, of yeah. a sociological study. And so the media were often interested in Muncie because it was Middletown. So a reporter from the Washington Post named Bernard Rossiter came to Muncie and sought me out and interviewed me. And there was an article on the front page of the Washington Post. NBC News apparently saw that article. And so they sent someone to Muncie. His name was um, Bob Lissett. He spent a great deal of time on campus just talking to different people and I was one of them and he determined that I should be featured in one of the segments and so this probably went on for over a month I spoke to him a lot and then they brought in Dean Brailis who was the on-air reporter and he interviewed me for about an hour and of course they boiled that all down to about 10 minutes or less yeah yeah <laughs> okay and so I guess with that, you kind of talked about the sort of national reactions to that coming out and all the sort of hateful letters coming at you, but I was kind of wondering how the Muncie community ha kind of saw that report. I know when a newspaper, I think Muncie Star Press had kind of talked about it, you had commented that you thought it was a uh, fair representation of the city of Muncie through the whole report and all of that, but a lot of other people within the community thought it was not particularly great for the city. So I wonder what you kind of saw there. Well, you know, um, there's a lot in the news these days about fake news and the media having a certain slant. And, and I would have to say that NBC was clearly in our corner. And I think they made, uh, there was a veteran who was featured in the news report. I think they made him look worse than he probably really was. And so I can understand why Muncie would have a bad reaction to what happened. Okay. So I guess then also in February, you had a chance to go to the Student Mobilization Committee in Cleveland. Uh, do you recall a lot about what was going on there? Or? No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> I, I probably know as much about it as you did from reading about it. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so then, I guess moving forward into March, uh, I guess the VMC got involved again with the anti-draft week going on. So mm -hmm. do you remember what you were doing as part of that? Well, um, we were encouraging people not to sign up for the draft or to burn their draft card, which yeah. was pretty radical. And I actually had a friend from high school who had uh, broken into a, a draft office and, oh, and burned the draft cards. He was part of the Beaver 55. And he and I think one of his partners came to Ball State and spoke as part of that march. Thing. Oh. And, and some people did rip up or burn their draft cards during that time or sign things that they were against it. Okay. And also see, had seen something looking through the uh, scrapbook about uh, some people going into the Muncie draft board and just kind of trying to hold up operations as much as possible. Uh, were you involved in that at all? Or? I don't believe I did that. Okay. I just remember them saying that they mm. were just asking nonstop questions just to prevent people from doing anything. Mm. So, mm -hmm. okay. So, uh, also with that, uh, there was a petition called, that was just titled, We Won't Go, that uh, mm -hmm. you managed to get a good number of people to sign. And the article had said that you were kind of surprised with the number of people that had actually done it. So mm -hmm. I guess I have to ask, was the, did Ball State really care that much about the war? Or did it kind of seem like the people on campus were kind of apathetic about what was going on? Oh, I'd say apathy was tremendously apathetic. Yeah, yeah. The, 
Um, people were just kind of interested in what was going on in their little world. Okay. Uh, and was that something that you saw the entire way through, or was that? Well, I would say that, um, you know, this gets kind of ahead of things, but um, after Kent State, oh, yeah. there was a huge outpouring. But I think that just hit home because they were just one state over and four students got killed. Oh, yeah. yeah. But going a little bit more ahead of that, after the Vietnam Moratorium Committee disbanded right before Kent State, and when I came back from my senior year, there was a Nothing ever happened again that was significant. Okay. Yeah, we were still in Vietnam, but really nobody was doing very much then. Okay. And was, I guess as well, did you face any sorts of opposition groups from students on campus? Uh, I forget what the name Project of Project Faith. Yes, them. Yes. So were they just, did they do that much or were they just kind of there to oppose you or? Well, their whole deal was, you should have faith in the president. He knows more than we do. Well, he did know more than we did. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so they just, uh, they had these petitions, letters people could sign saying, we support Nixon, whatever he wants to do, which I thought was pretty stupid. <laughs> All right, so I guess moving forward a little bit, uh, in April of 1970, there was another moratorium and a few other events going on with there. There, So I guess leading up to it, there was the Fast for Peace that you did. So what exactly did that entail and what did you do there? Well, I think we were supposed to fast. I think it was more than one day. It might have been three. And we were supposed to donate any money that we would have spent on food to um, helping people who'd been hurt by the war in Vietnam. Okay. And I personally did do the fast, and several people did, but one part that wasn't good is we tried to get the dormitories to refund us the money for the meals we didn't eat, but they wouldn't do that, so we didn't get much money for fasting. Sounds about right for Paul State. <laughs> <laughs> and also, the, the head of the National Vietnam Moratorium Committee came to Ball State and gave a speech at that April event. Okay. So that was pretty big. And his name was Sam Brown, right? Uh-huh. Okay, and what was that like actually having the national leader of this being able to come to little old Muncie? <laughs> that was just <laughs> fantastic. I really, and I, I, you know, he was kind of a hero to me. Now I look back, he was only a few years older than me, but he just seemed like so big. And, um, and I think we attracted a lot of people, and, and he spoke in downtown Muncie, so once again, we did get off campus for that. Okay. And I guess, was that particular moratorium much the same as the ones that had occurred earlier, or was there some other? Well, I think we got more interest, and in, um, and having him come was certainly good. And I, I, my guess is we got more community involvement since we held it right there in Muncie. Okay. And so, I, based on that, I would assume that there wasn't the same sort of backlash as the ones in December had? Yeah, or? yeah it, it, it did seem to be less. And also, um, the, the Daily News got a new editor who supported what we did. The okay. previous editors had always editorialized against us, but the new editor was more in favor of us. And also, I think we got better at what we were doing, and so their criticisms just weren't true anymore. At first, they said we didn't know what we were doing, and it was true, really. Um, so, but we did know what we were doing by April. Okay. And so, you mentioned how the Daily News was kind of against you mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess, what was that experience like trying to deal with that? <sighs> that was so frustrating. Uh, yeah, they, yeah, just week after week, they would undermine us, and yeah, that that was hard. And the irony is, at the end of that school year, I was awarded the Campus Headliner Award um, because I'd made so many headlines. But they went out of their way in within the award itself to say 
we don't support anything she did, but we're going <laughs> to give her this award. If I had to do it over again, I would have taken the award and ripped it up or something. But anyway, yeah. And that was, was that with the uh, old editors that were doing the awarding, or um, it was actually the journalism department. Oh, okay. Yeah, that might explain some of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I guess after the April one, is that when the VMC started to? sort of end or? Yeah, the uh, National Committee d decided they had done as much as they could with that idea of protest and so they disbanded it. Okay, but then of course in May of 1970 we have the Kent State shootings and Ball State having a pretty significant uh, protest up against that. Uh, so how, I guess, how involved were you with that well, I was I was not the leader of that. Other people okay. other people stepped forward. I was certainly active the whole day, um, but other people were in charge of it, and they really did a great job and kept everything peaceful once again. Because I think after four students get killed, there's more yeah. likelihood that somebody might think violence is a good idea. But um, everything went smoothly, and in fact, President Pruis, uh, although he wouldn't close classes, he did say some supportive things. Okay. Uh, and I have seen in some places that this wasn't quite as much as a, of a protest as it was more of a, I guess, remembrance and stuff like that. Would that be accurate? Well, I'll probably it had more to do with um, being upset about the four students getting killed, but we also talked, the reason there was the protest at Kent State was because we had started bombing Cambodia. Okay. So we had quite a bit to say about bombing Cambodia. Okay. Now, with you also just brought up uh, President Pruis and him giving a speech there. Up, uh, how? Did well, I don't think he gave a speech, oh, okay. but he he sent some remarks over. Okay, uh, but I guess then, how were the reactions with or interactions with him throughout the uh, VMC years? D did he really? I never, I never, I never, I never interacted with him. Okay. Yeah. Did he uh, make any remarks on the VMC at any point, or? Not that I, not that I, I don't think so. Okay. So, and with the uh, Kent State protests, were there any sorts of faculty involvement there? I know, mm -hmm. reading through the newspapers, Tony Edmonds was probably the mm -hmm. highlighted one, the most mm -hmm. part. But I don't mm -hmm. know if there was any other. Well, I think a lot of faculty came out for that, but I, you know, we weren't writing people's names down, so I couldn't really say for sure. Okay. And so I guess looking back at the whole of the VMC and with this, what do you think that you really were able to change some people's minds about the Vietnam War or like change them to think that they they shouldn't support what's going on anymore? Or? Well, that would, that would be hard to say with any certainty. I, I believe that we did, though, um, because we were, we operated in such a way that we had things in the newspaper frequently. If people read it and thought, I would think it would have changed their minds. Okay. So, I guess moving forward a bit, now mm -hmm. that the VMC is mm -hmm. kind of gone at this point, you still had one more year of your uh, mm -hmm. experience here at Ball State. Uh, I guess I'll ask, is there any, or was there any sort of, any sign of Vietnam protest still on campus at that point, or was it just kind of? Well, it's hard to believe, um, you know, I, I kept the scrapbook of everything that happened when I was in charge, so I don't really have a record of what happened after that, but I, I don't believe very much happened. Okay. Um, and. I kind of turned towards some other things, and the big thing that I got involved with my senior year was the Crisis Intervention Center, which was a listening, um, it was a suicide prevention hotline. Oh, okay. So I kind of pivoted toward that. Um, I actually, I, one of my biggest regrets as I protested the war is that I was for peace, but I don't think my life was very peaceful, and I think getting involved on a personal level with people who were in distress 
was a different way of being for peace. And so I got very involved in that. And my honor, this gets us to the Honors College. Okay. I wrote my honors thesis on the Crisis Intervention Center. And um, it, it turned out to be kind of like a manual on how to start a suicide prevention hotline. Okay. And was there any sort of specific thing that brought you into the, uh, that sort of in, being interested in the Crisis Intervention Hotline? or? Well, um, as you know, I minored in psychology, and I was very interested in that, and so it really appealed to me to do something directly to help people. And as you also know, I eventually became a psychologist, so I think that being involved in that okay. uh, really helped me get to where I am now. Okay. And I guess going back to sort of the honors things, did you take any sorts of honors classes your senior year? I think I had seen that you had done some colloquiums. but Right, and, and that must have been the one I had with Dean Lawhead. And then the, um, the person who supervised, I don't know what it was called, uh, my honors project. His name was Ken Nunnally. He was in the counseling department, so I don't think he was really in the honors department. So, so this is my honors thesis. Okay. Yeah. And I don't think that there was really any sort of honors faculty aside from maybe the dean and a few other people. I think they just mm. got it from mm. whatever departments, and they just kind of stuck an H next to the class to say it was honors. Oh, so. okay, okay. So, yeah, that's why it just wasn't clear to me which ones were honors and which weren't. Um, I would say on my my senior year probably wasn't my best year in college. I I, I think I sent you my transcript. Yeah. And I got some C's. I'm just like, whew, horrified. Um, and I also had to start, I was going to be a teacher, so I had to start taking courses on how to teach. Okay. And then at the end of my senior year, I had to go student teach. So I left campus at the end of my senior year and student taught in Indianapolis. Okay. I remembered that when we did our phone call, you had uh, commented that uh, you weren't entirely sure how you graduated with all the things that you did. So. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, well, it doesn't look like I really did such a great job. Okay. Uh, so were some of those lower degrees just from all everything you were in? Lower grades, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> were any of those lower grades uh, a result of all the activities you were part of, or was just that? just kind of the stress of senior year sort of thing or? I don't, I, I really, I can't explain why. Yeah, because I really probably wasn't as busy my senior year as I'd been before, but I, I, I got more C's then than I ever did before. Okay, and I guess kind of relating back to uh, the Vietnam or VMC committee stuff things, did you face any sorts of stigma or any sorts of as backlash from the staff in your senior year who remembered that you were still involved with or were involved with that no okay no i don't believe i well i had one now this is i don't think it had anything to do with the vmc but i was taking a speech class and believe it or not girls generally wore skirts and I gave a speech wearing a pantsuit that was pretty much a Hillary Clinton type <laughs> oh, pantsuit. So I'm not talking about any, I wasn't wearing yoga pants. And I gave my speech and he lowered it one grade and wrote pants. <laughs> so. Gosh. Oh no. Yeah. yeah, I know, it's hard to believe. Okay. So you graduated in 1971 then, so mm -hmm. had you met your husband at that point or was that still a ways off? No, I met him in, oh well, maybe that had to do with my bad grades. I met him, <laughs> I met him in September of 1970 and then he moved to Canada and he, he got it backwards. He went to Vietnam, then he went to Canada. So, uh, but he didn't like it up there so much, so he called me up and asked uh, about moving down to Muncie, which he did, and we moved in together in January of 1970. Okay. And just out of curiosity, what was he doing at that point now that he was out of Vietnam? He was writing. He was a full-time writer, and okay. he collected unemployment. <laughs> okay. 
So you graduated in 71 and you started working as a medical assistant then. So do you remember where that was and mm -hmm. how long that you were there? Well, okay, so, so I did my student teaching at Arsenal Technical High School in Indianapolis and I, this, this would be a, a hard part. Of, uh, my father was very upset that I had moved in with my husband and we were living in the same town. Okay. And he caused us a lot of trouble. So I finished my student teaching early and we moved to New Jersey because it was, my father had become threatening so we had to get out of town. Okay. So we moved to New Jersey and lived with my husband's family who didn't have the issues my father had. And then we moved to Wisconsin, and that's where, and I thought I would get a job as a teacher, but there was a glut of English teachers at that time, um, because I think I was qualified, um, but I didn't get a job, so I got a job as a medical assistant. Okay. And sorry to go back for a second here, but I forgot to ask you what your husband's name is. Oh, it's Robert Lewis Posner, and he's called Lou. Okay. So... You moved to Wisconsin to do your uh, things with being a medical assistant. So, yeah. and I know you had said over the phone that this is where you really started to really become interested in uh, psychology. So, how did that start to develop up there? Well, um, I just after work I read books on psychology. I went to the library and I, I read must have read I read dozens of books on psychology. And I met a woman who worked as a psychiatric nurse at a state hospital, and she arranged for me to spend a day at the state hospital, and I was just fascinated. And that made me think even more, it would be good to be a psychologist. And I was so, I don't think college students are as naive as this now. I didn't know that it was hard to get into graduate school. So <laughs> we said, oh, it would be fun to live in Bloomington. Why don't I go to school there? So I applied <laughs> to graduate school and I studied for my GREs and we moved to Bloomington because I was going to go to school. So we moved there and I didn't get in. No. <laughs> so uh, so that, that was... Uh, so I thought, okay, we're here. What am I going to do? So I got a job as a secretary. And I went to talk to the chairman of the admissions committee. And I said, what can I do? I really want to be a psychologist. So he told me to take classes as a continuing ed student with the people who had been admitted. So I took personality theory, and then I took sensory psychology, and I took physiological psychology. And those are all pretty difficult courses. And I did very well. So I thought I had a pretty good chance of getting in, but I, they didn't admit me again. So then I got a job as a research assistant for a professor of neuroscience. So I was in the building, I was working in the building, and I just think somebody probably didn't accept IU's offer to come there, and then they took me. So that's how that <laughs> happened. So I, that's been a very useful thing um, as a psychologist now. If I have people who have disappointments in their life and want to give up, I share that story because it really paid to be persistent. Okay. And what year did you finally actually get accepted? <laughs> uh, must have been 1973. Okay. Yeah. And were there... Aside from being admit, admitted, uh, were there any sorts of difficulties being in that program with an English degree, since that's not necessarily the uh, yeah. traditional route? So. Yeah, well, I think it was difficult to get admitted, obviously. Um, and uh, I, no, I, I actually think my English degree has served me well, even as a therapist, because I think you can learn a lot about psychology from reading fiction, and I was a good writer, so I think it really helped me in, in my psychology. Okay. And so, I guess, what was your experience like at IU once you finally were accepted and were working on your way towards a degree? Um, it was very, very difficult. It was a very hard program to be in. Um, I use psychology department is very science oriented. Okay. 
and they're, they're not, and I'm a clinical psychologist, and I don't think they really knew much about how to be a cl clinicians. And the year I was admitted, there were no female faculty members in clinical psychology. Now that is totally different now, but that year there were no females on the faculty, but our class was predominantly female. And I got it, the, the male faculty had no idea how to deal with us. <laughs> because we would have meetings and they did a lot of things that made life difficult for us. And several of us would start crying, which had probably never happened in a psychology meeting before. Um, but I think we kind of humanized the psychology department. And I had a wonderful group of colleagues that I'm still friends with and uh, they really saved my life. But IU's psychology program was very difficult. And, um, you know, I'm proud that I went there, but I, I have to say they were not very supportive of students. You would think, since it's so hard to get in, yeah. that once you were in, they would do everything they could to support you and nurture you and help you along your way. But in fact, they were very critical and mean at times and that were not supportive. And I cried many bitter tears during my years as a graduate student. Um, I, I had some faculty say some really mean things to me. So, so anyway, that, that part wasn't the greatest, but I had this wonderful group of fellow students and that got me through. Okay, and so how would you say that compares with your Ball State experience as far as? I'd say that? Ball State was warmer and friendlier. And, and I have a lot of good memories of the psychology department. I never had been exposed to psychology before, but I liked it so much at Ball State that I was ready to major in it. And um, okay. I think looking back on it, and even a paper I wrote at the time, I think women were discouraged from pursuing a psychology degree. And that's why they didn't want me to major in psychology. That was something for men to do. And I don't think they do that now. And a professor in the psychology department um, was an anti-war protester. And he, in fact, protested in Cincinnati and got arrested. His name was Dr. Renke, R-E-N-K-E. So um, I love the psychology department. Okay. And did you remember any sorts of other experiences at Ball State? Sorry to go back in time a little bit with that, but mm. with the psychology department? Um, I don't know, they just opened my eyes to a whole new world and uh, they were very good professors and very encouraging and I really learned a lot. Okay, so moving forward a little bit, so you graduated from IU in 1978? Yes. Okay, and so from there, you went almost immediately out to Connecticut for mm -hmm. your internship. So mm -hmm. how did you end up that far away from Indiana? Well, my husband is from New Jersey. Okay. And he had compromised and lived in Indiana for 10 years. And I felt like I owed it to him to give him a chance to be closer to his family. So I applied for internships all over the East Coast and ended up in Connecticut. Okay. And you were at the... Connecticut Valley Hospital. So mm -hmm. what was that sort of experience like doing the internship up there? Um, it was a state hospital, which we don't really have anymore. Um, and that was back before deinstitutionalization. So it was a huge, it was like a college campus. There were all hmm. kinds of buildings and pretty severely disturbed people were locked up there. I had an excellent supervisor. I, I, all the things I should have learned about being a therapist at IU, I learned at Connecticut Valley Hospital. And one of the wards that I worked on was for people who were criminally insane. So that was very interesting. Oh, wow. So, Okay. Yeah. So what was that sort of experience like working on that ward then? Well, um, that was probably a place I might have been afraid, but... Um, I, I just was so interested in what made people tick that I really wanted to get to know these people. So I, I saw a lot of people who had killed people, and uh, it was obvious that they w were not in their right minds. 
and um, it was just very interesting to get to know them and figure out how their minds worked. And I never had any disorder at all. I'd have a men's group of all these criminally insane people and never had any problems with them at all, never any violence. Uh, we got along pretty well. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And you had also said that while doing your internship there, you had learned the sort of things that uh, IU should have taught you. Do you remember what some of those things might have been? Well, um, how to be a therapist, how to sit in a room and help people. I, you know, we did that at IU, but the faculty were pretty much scientific professors, and okay. I don't think very good at being clinicians, whereas on an internship, these people worked with patients all day long, and they really knew what they were doing. Okay. Yeah. So when did you end up uh, finishing that internship? It was one year. One year? Okay. Mm -hmm. So then you moved on to joining the workforce from there. Mm -hmm. So uh, you went to Fairfield Hills Hospital, I believe? Yes. So what was that experience there? Well, it was a state hospital very similar to Connecticut Valley. And okay. I really liked people who were, these were people who were schizophrenic and bipolar disorder and really the typical picture of insanity, that's who they were. And I interviewed for this job at Fairfield Hills Hospital. I got a job working on a ward that was so bad that they fooled me during my interview. They didn't even show me where I was going to work. Oh, gosh. So this ward was for mentally retarded psychotic patients. So the, the worst of the worst, this was the ward that people were afraid to work on because there was a lot of violence. And uh, so I, I was in charge of this ward. Okay. So, uh, but I, I really applied everything I knew about psychology and we did a lot of behavior modification and we really turned that ward around. But the, the, and the staff were about as scary as the patients. <laughs> Some, I know some of them carried knives in their brassieres. Oh, gosh. Because I, I, I heard that they did. They were scary. Uh, and they didn't like me so well because I really expected them to work pretty hard, which they hadn't been doing too much. So that was a, a really challenging job. Um, but it was very stressful. And I would be crying when I was brushing my teeth in the morning about what I was facing that day. And I found out about an opportunity to start a partial hospital program at a general hospital. And that's a pretty common thing now. But back then, people were either in the hospital or they were out of the hospital. So they started this thing called partial hospitalization where people would go to the hospital during the day and go home at night. So I got hired to start this whole program at a hospital in Derby, Connecticut. And that's what I did next. Okay. And do you remember what year that was? Or? Uh, I think it was 1985. Okay. Yeah. And what, sorry, what was the name of that hospital? Uh, Griffin Hospital. Griffin? Okay. Yeah. And, and I started the day treatment center. And I eventually became president of the Connecticut Partial Hospital Association. Okay. And uh, so that was really my thing. So how did you wind up going through the ranks to become president? Um, I was very enthusiastic and I really believed in it and I presented at the American Association for Partial Hospitalization and, and wrote a paper that was published. It was really, um, that was my niche. That's what I really wanted to do as a psychologist because I didn't think people should be locked up for the rest of their lives and this was an alternative. Okay. So by 1984, Five, you also started your own private practice? Well, then point? I must be wrong. Uh, it must have been 19, must have been maybe 1980 that I okay. started at Griffin. So, because I did that for several years. And then, um, then I quit that job and started a private practice. Okay. And so what convinced you to do that? Were you just tired of the hospital life or was there some other reason? Well, or? it's kind of a sad story. Um, it was a stressful job and I, did, I t brought my stress at home. So my husband and I were in couples therapy and our, our therapist looked at us one day and said, 
Mary, why don't you quit that job? Now, therapists don't <laughs> usually do things like that. And I said, well, I can't do that. You know, we, we need the, uh, my husband was an artist at that time, so I was the primary breadwinner, and I didn't think I could just quit my job. He says, oh, you could go into private practice. And I said, well, I don't know anything about that. He said, oh, it's not that hard. So, <laughs> so I quit my job. <laughs> oh, God. And it, it, uh, and I did really well. Yeah. Okay. And so, I guess, how does that experience with the private practice then compare to some of your other experiences working in the more hospital setting? Um, well, I saw people who were much healthier, for one, and I saw people from young children to old age, whereas um, in the hospital setting it was usually um, people over 20 and un under 90. Um, so it was really interesting to learn how to treat children and I did a lot of psychological testing for vocational rehabilitation and I learned how to do couples therapy and I also got training in hypnosis which was really expanded my skills as a psychologist and so I, I did very well. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. So also in 1985, you had the chance to be the assistant clinical professor at Yale. So mm -hmm. how did that come about? Yeah. I th my life's kind of, these weird things happen to me. Um, the, uh, the mental health center associated with Yale University wanted to start a partial hospital program. So they consulted with me, since I was president of the Partial Hospital Association, about how to go about that. So I got to know those people. And I, um, so I was introduced to Dr. Um, John Strauss, who was one of the international experts on schizophrenia. He was on the faculty at Yale. And he was interested in this partial hospital program. And somehow he arranged for me to get on the clinical faculty at Yale and so that I could supervise interns in their partial hospital program. And I also collaborated with him and another psychologist on writing a paper about partial hospitalization. So that was a fantastic experience. Okay. And so did you enjoy that experience? Oh, I, I loved it. I had a library card for the Yale University Library, which was worth its weight in gold. I really, really <laughs> liked that. And working with Dr. Strauss, he was an excellent writer and very encouraging, and he, he was a great mentor. Okay. And then along with that, uh, did you feel like this was your opportunity to really put the things that you learned getting your English degree here at Ball State to the test? Uh, since you had come in thinking that you were wanting to be a teacher originally, mm -hmm. so. Well, yeah, I, I think that's a good point. And I think also um, Dr. Strauss seemed to think I was a very good writer. Um, so I, I think being an English major really helped me. Okay. So you also had a chance to be faculty at Southern Connecticut State during that time as well. So was mm -hmm. that sort of the similar Oh, uh, That was thing? just something I signed up for. Oh, okay. um, I probably knew some people at that college and they needed people to teach introductory psychology so I signed up to teach that. Okay. So I guess in the late 1980s then you, uh, I, what year was this, uh, when you uh, decided to move out to Indiana? Then? That was 1988. 88? Okay, mm -hmm. so what kind of prompted some of that? Your, the decision to do that. Okay, well, it's another one of those crazy things. Um, <laughs> my my husband and I wanted to live on a farm. Okay. And if you know anything about Connecticut, the likelihood of living on a farm in Connecticut was pretty slim. Uh, the, just to buy a house was out of this world. Um, and one day I saw in the APA monitor an ad for a job in the rolling hills of southern Indiana and there was something about that that just really appealed to me. So I thought, what the heck? And I applied for the job. And we asked to get a newspaper from the town where this job was, which was Tell City. And they sent us a newspaper. Well, we could buy two or three houses in, in Indiana <laughs> compared to a little piece of property in Connecticut. So um, 
So we thought we'd fly out and see what it was like. And I had never been south of Bloomington and Southern Indiana is absolutely beautiful. So we came down to Southern Indiana and just fell in love with it. And um, I, I t well, I had turned down the job, but I thought, I bet I could start a private practice in Indiana. Well, you can't get a loan for a home if you don't have a job. So I ended yeah. up taking the job and we moved to southern Indiana. We bought a 40-acre farm, and we had cattle and ducks and goats and a pond, and it was just incredible. Okay. And you mentioned that you had taken a job. What job was that? Um, I worked for Southern Hills Counseling Center. It was a community mental health center. Okay. And did that compare at all to any of the places that you were at in Connecticut? or? Well, um, it was doing outpatient therapy, so it was somewhat like being in private practice, except that I didn't have control over my schedule or, or what I did, so I didn't really like it very much. Okay. So that's probably where you started to head into a private practice again then? Mm-hmm. Okay. So have you been doing that since you moved here then? So, or Yeah, since um, I've had my own private practice since 1990. Okay. So... Sorry. So, uh, I apologize for that. Uh, with the private practice, was it, is it pretty much the same thing you were doing at Connecticut, or is there some differences there? Well, I would say that in Connecticut, the population, well, for, for one, in Connecticut, the number of therapists per capita is quite high. In okay. southern Indiana, it's quite low. Um, so, like, I'm the only psychologist in two counties. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's a whole different situation. Um, I mean, I had a, a very successful practice in Connecticut, but I would say they would get along fine without me when I left. But where I am now, I'm the only psychologist in two counties. I know they really need me down there, and I... I have a waiting list at all times, and I see people who really, they, they want to come in and solve problems. They don't just want to come in and talk to somebody. They, they're coming in because something really bad has happened, and I just love working with the kind of people I work with down there. Okay, and I guess uh, how does being down there in southern Indiana really compare to how you were living up in your younger years when you were like in Indianapolis, Muncie, and later Bloomington, how does that sort of compare there? It's very boring. <laughs> I, I like to say the only culture is agriculture. I mean, it's really a small town, and I feel pretty isolated down there. It, it's fun being up here in Muncie just to be around. I, there aren't that many people with a college degree, really, where I live. Okay. So I miss, I miss, I, I miss being around people who are educated, um, but I have a husband who's very, he, he, we can talk about anything, so that, that helps, and I do have some friends down there, but it's, it's nothing like being here where you can go to, there's no coffee shop, for example, yeah. Yeah. and I don't have professional colleagues, so I really miss that too. Okay, but would you say you enjoy it more down there than being up here, or? <sighs> There are pros and cons. I love, um, uh, we did have the 40 acre farm, which I loved. And now we have since, we live in the woods. I love nature. I love being around the trees. I love gardening. Um, you couldn't have friendlier people than the people that we live among. Um, they would do anything for you. And I, we didn't have a key to our house for probably 10 years, because we never, and we never locked our door. So, there are some really wonderful things about being where we are. Okay. So, I guess, uh, I guess I'll ask, now that you're back here at Ball State, not Ball State, uh, back here in Indiana, do you still, like, do you still, like, carry some of the things you learned at Ball State with you in your practices today, or? Well, yeah, I, I would think, well, I mean, it was at Ball State that I first volunteered to be, work for Crisis Connection, so that, okay. 
that or crisis intervention center so that obviously is carried forward and I was president of the Spencer County Mental Health Association for a while so I still believe in um, doing things with the community um, what else I don't think there are any I don't think I know anybody who graduated from Ball State in uh, there must be some in Perry County but I, I don't know them um, I think having grown up in Indiana has really helped me relate to the people that I see now. I think if I had been born in Connecticut, they probably couldn't relate to me. Okay. So, I guess, do you still keep in contact with any people that you were working with, like the VMC, or? Well, to tell you the truth, um, until last summer, no. But I got in touch with a couple of people last summer, and we're planning this 50th reunion. And so I've been in contact with a lot more people over this past year, and it's really been uh, pretty amazing to, to to talk to them now. And a lot of them remember that time as uh, one of the most important times of their life, so that, that feels really good. Um, I do have a few friends now, uh, well, because once they invented Facebook, everything <laughs> changed. So I'm in touch with a lot of people from Ball State now that I hadn't been for many years, and that's really been good. Okay. And you mentioned that there's the anniversary of the uh, VMC that's coming up. I believe it's this coming uh, fall, mm -hmm. if I'm correct. So mm -hmm. how involved are you with uh, getting that all up and running? Extremely involved. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a second job. It, uh, it's been a lot of work. Okay. And but it's so, been fun. Okay. And so what are you, sort of things that you're planning on doing with that? Well, on Thursday evening, we're going to have a reunion of people who were involved back in the day. And uh, so I've been in, doing a lot of work trying to find people and corresponding with them and convincing them to come. And so that's really been great. And then... So we're having the reunion Thursday night, and then Friday we're having an all-day conference on the subject of um, what it's kind of our slogan is re reunite, remember, rekindle. So we're going to reunite on Thursday night, and then on Friday I'm going to give a speech kind of summarizing what we did back okay. then, and then we're going to have a keynote speaker, David Harris, who was the most famous draft resistor back in the 60s. Okay. He's going to be our keynote speaker. And then we have several panels, discussions, one involving veterans, one involving talking about what happened then, uh, what did we do right and what did we do wrong, and a, a panel on where's the peace movement going now. And then we're going to end with a memorial service. And the um, person who's supervising you right now is my co-chair for this <laughs> event and we have worked very hard together to organize this. Okay. And do you, you expect that many people from the VMC to come out to this? Or? Well, it's hard to say. I think right now uh, 12 is about all I know for sure, but okay. I'm going to keep, uh, a lot of it is, um, I guess they're the sort of people who don't sign up to be on Ball State's address list because okay. I haven't been able to find most of the people that were involved. Okay. So, I guess as we're starting to come closer to the end of this interview, uh, I guess looking back on your Ball State experience, how, how would you say that it's kind of affected your life kind of up to now? Well, I mean, if I hadn't gone to Ball State, I... I I don't think any of my life would be the same. Um, I think I got a really good education at Ball State, and not only in the classroom, but because of all the things I was involved with, I really got a good education for life. And, you know, because other people wouldn't do certain things, I kind of got pushed into this leadership role, and I, I still feel like I have some skills as a leader, and I still have a social conscience. Um, I. It's really been nice to come back to Ball State. I hadn't been back here until last year. It's a beautiful campus, and it really kind of touched my heart today. I walked past the place where the student government offices were in the student center, and I remember spending a lot of time there. Um, 
So I think my extracurricular activities probably affected me almost as much as what I learned in the classroom. And I think um, I was really encouraged to, to think in different ways. Like I say, when I started, all I knew about was being a Catholic. I'm not even interested in being a Catholic now. And the beginning of that was coming to Ball State and learning about different things. And I think the professors really took an interest in me as a student and encouraged me. And I learned how to be a teacher. I, I, had, I was absolutely confident that I could go out in the world and be a teacher. So I, I think Ball State served me well. All right. And then you mentioned that you're not really involved with religion anymore. So did that, you said that started at Ball State. When did that really start to go away? Well, my husband's Jewish, and that really kind of convinced me that, you know, and I met all these wonderful people who were Jewish, and I thought, well, okay, who can say they're not going to heaven? And so I just didn't buy all this Catholic stuff anymore okay. and just had a broader perspective. And I took a course on, a course I really remember at Ball State was on Emerson, Whitman, and Thoreau, who are my, three of my favorites. And I, when I got married, we had to put down a religion and I put transcendentalism. So, <laughs> so that, that's what really influenced me. Okay. And do you remember who taught that course? Oh, I can picture him. Newcomb? I think, yeah, and he would, he was such, I think he just did this to irritate us. He would have his book, and he'd page through it, and he'd read something that Thoreau said, and he says, well, that's a bunch of malarkey, <laughs> and he would just, he, he would just show no respect at all for these people, and I think it just got <laughs> us more challenged to be into them, so, so that was a great class. Okay. <laughs> all right, so. I guess I also want to ask, uh, do you, I know you don't remember a ton about the, your honors education, but do you mm -hmm. think that being part of the honors program really helped set you up in both your educational experience and your life experience? Well, you know, one thing, I, I think that um, the honors classes were smaller, and so I think I was able to have better relationships with my professors, even though I'm sorry to say I don't remember a lot of them, because uh, it was small. And uh, unlike my experience in graduate school, I think they really were interested in helping us. Um, so, so I guess that, that would be the main thing, the small classes and the interest the professors took in us. Okay. So, I guess also looking back, if you could give any sorts of advice or tell your like 20 year old self anything, what would you do based on sort of the experience that you, experiences that you've had? I would keep a better journal <laughs> <laughs> so I would remember more. Um, I, 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 I think, I don't know. what. I would have tried harder in some of those classes in my senior year. I, I wouldn't change a thing about all the things I got involved with because I really think that contributed to my education. Um, I, I, might have, I might have taken more advantage of being in the honors program. It seems like I didn't make the most of it. Okay. So I guess as we're starting to wrap up the interview. Is there anything that I haven't talked about or asked you about that you'd like to ask or to like to ask about or if you'd like to have on uh, the record for this? Well, um, I think one thing we haven't touched on really was what it was like living in a dormitory. Oh, okay. And um, that was a great experience for me okay. uh, to to live in a dormitory with all these people I didn't know and to, to form relationships that were really close with other people in the dormitory. And, uh, and I was active, of course, in the student government in, in Baker Hall itself. So dormitory life was really, that was much more meaningful to me than being in a sorority, to, to really get to know all these girls from all over the place. Okay. And to have a roommate that I didn't know and have to get along with her. I think that was, and actually my roommate my freshman year 
tried to kill herself. So that might have also influenced my later career decisions too. Okay. Yeah. And were there any sorts of dorm-specific events that you were a part of? I know you mentioned spring scene. Yes, and, and, back, I, so. and I did find the picture. <laughs> so this is spring scene. We're all spring scene. We're all dressed up like animals, <laughs> and we just had a blast. Um, and I, I guess I feel sorry for students now. Back then, we didn't. The only appliance anybody had in a room was a popcorn popper, <laughs> and nobody had a television. I, we probably had a radio. But you, if you wanted to look at television, you had to go down to the lounge. And so we intermingled, I think, a lot more. We didn't expect to live in our room. And, and I kind of feel sorry for college students now that they don't have that. We were forced to, to be together. And you know, we had to go down to the hall, to the bathroom, to all those showers and everything. <laughs> Not the great, but yeah, we got to know each other. And um, I don't know exactly what it's like now, but I bet it's not like that. I really couldn't comment yeah. on that since I'm not in the dorm, so. Yeah. All right, uh, did you have any other topics that you had wanted to talk about that we hadn't gotten a chance to? Um, well, a, a funny story that I often think about with college is, um, you know, I came from a large family, we didn't have a lot of money, and, and I feel bad about this, this now, but I, I was so concerned how I was gonna type my papers because the family typewriter wasn't coming with me. And I could type 100 words a minute, but I didn't have a typewriter. So I, th this has made me a nervous wreck the whole summer. And I walk into the dorm, and there's a typewriter. <laughs> and my first words to my roommate were, oh, you have a typewriter. <laughs> So that wasn't maybe very nice, but that, uh, and I don't know what students go through now, um, but uh, yeah, I, I really didn't have very much money. My brother was a newspaper boy. He delivered papers, and he used to send me a couple of dollars to help me out. So that's okay. what things were like for me. And I was the first girl to wear blue jeans to the student senate. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wore skirts, and I was the first person to wear blue jeans, so that was memorable. Um, during my years at Ball State, that was also the beginning of women's liberation, oh, okay. and there was this whole protest against beauty pageants, and there was a bra burning in front of the beauty pageants, so that was a thing that happened. Um, and and I, I think that whole women's liberation thing had a big impact on me, and Dean Lawhead was really uh, ahead of his time. He was very supportive of all of that and, and thought that women should be treated equally. Okay. And were you really involved in the women's liberation things or were you more? Well, not so much because I was doing my thing with the anti-war movement. Okay. So, but, but yeah, to some extent I was involved. Yeah. Okay. So did you have anything else? Or? Uh, I think I've probably said enough. <laughs> all right. All right. With that, uh, we will conclude our interview. Uh, I want to thank you again for taking the time to uh, come up here to Ball State to mm -hmm. be interviewed. Mm -hmm. And with that, we will wrap this up. Okay, it's been my pleasure. Thank you.